Now to the, the working horse and the working horse role in the United States. There's no doubt um, over the years, certainly over the 20th century, the, the role of the working horse has diminished. It used to be very important for transportation. It used to also be very important for agriculture and um, telecommunications because we had the Pony Express and so on and so forth. Um, working horses are still used in the United States and um, um, ranches out west um, use working horses, ranch horses, um, whether it's Texas, the upper midwest, various other states in the, in the sort of northwest. They are big ranches um, and you know they have cattle out grazing in, in large open spaces so they need um, ranch horses to sort of um, bring them in, move them around, do various different things, check fence lines, um, check um, the physical well-being of the cattle and the livestock and so forth. But sadly, even those types of horses are being somewhat replaced by um, ATVs and various other sort of mechanical um, replacements, even your regular um, pickup truck. Um, ran ranch horses um, are kept, um, you know, maybe they're turned out in the winter when they're less used, um, le left out there in the, in the raw weather and those that survive come in in the spring. And, um, and go back to work and, and maybe some that come back in and, and, and aren't um, able to do the work, then they are um, um, on, on to do other, other things. Um, and ranch horses do work. They work very hard, 12, 14 hour days and so on and so forth. And some ranches will have um, so their own breeding stock and various other, other things in place to sort of help breed their own um, working horse. Um, so the ranch horse, um, whose role is somewhat diminishing, is still um, important in some areas of the United States. Uh, you have the Amish people, um, which is more prevalent in the northeast of the um, United States, um, who use horses for two different reasons. One, still for transportation. So if you're in Pennsylvania, in Lancaster County, for example, you'll see them trotting around the roads. Um, and they're typically um, ex-standard breds um, from the harness racing um, industry. Um, and you'll also see the big Percheron um, still um, helping um, uh, work the fields um, in the agriculture. Um, Percherons used to be um, huge in the United States up through to probably around the Second World War in terms of agriculture. And um, they're, they're, they've been absolutely downsized um, in, in terms of their use. Um, and really only, only communities like the Amish um, using them to any significant um, numbers. Um, so the working horse's role overall in the United States has diminished significantly, um, um, more so than the, 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 the racing horse. Um, but two-thirds of the horses in the United States are for pleasure, um, pleasure horses, um, lots and lots of horses used out west um, in the sort of western pleasure, cutting horses is big, reining and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of pleasure horse use out west. Um, pleasure horse use also on, on the eastern side, maybe not, not as much, that's just my own theory. I don't really have anything to support that. Um, but uh, we use them um, east in, in various shows and so on and so forth. Um, and they are uh, typically out west, they're certainly quarter horses. Um, they, um, we in the east with our eventing and so forth, we like to import warm bloods or dumb bloods or whatever you call them. Um, pr I would prefer obviously that we use retired race horses and there has been a movement to try to increase the number of retired race horses to transition into equestrian um, events. So that's been actually quite a good thing. Trail riding and so forth, also big um, in the pleasure. Obviously to support all these different industries, whether it's sports, working or pleasure, we have to have breeding industries. You have the AQHA that supports the quarter horse. That's very big in the United States. I don't know if it's a half or a little less than half of all horses in the United States, but it's a lot of big number of horses. Um, on the horse racing side, um, we have the thoroughbreds are the, are the, 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 the big breed. Um, and the, the fall crops on the thoroughbred side have diminished significantly over the last 15 years, I would say. And that's become a problem for the racetracks and, and for the horsemen. Um, but maybe that's a good thing also because, um, you know, the, the, the issue potentially of unwanted horses and so forth. So um, those are the big um, um, breeding side. Obviously, we also have a standard bred be breeding industry um, in this country. It's on a little bit of a smaller scale than the thoroughbred be breeding industry. Finally, we have the wild horses, which is part of the Western culture mostly, 
Um, and they, um, they, they are actually, uh, in reality, feral horses, um, but um, a lot of them trace, trace the roots back to, to the Mustang, the, the horse that came over with the Spanish in the 1500s, so they're part of that sort of um, legacy of developing um, the, the United States. Um, and, um, and, and from that perspective, they're actually a, a little bit of a t part of the sort of Western culture tourist um, attraction, so that's pretty cool. Um, they, there are two, I, I would categorize wild horses into two um, um, broad categories. Those that um, live on um, um, BLM land, uh, Bureau of Land Management, I think that's what it stands for, and those that um, live on the lands of the Native Americans. Um, those are on the BLM lands. Um, they are protected from going to horse slaughter, or at least directly, I think, you know, if someone adopts a horse out and has it for a year or two, they can do what they want with it, but that's my um, speculation. But they can't go directly from the BLM lands to slaughter. Um, but the, the, one of the problems with the BLM is they have to sort of manage their horse herd populations, or at least that's the perspective that they have to do. Those horses are competing on those lands with sort of ranchers, cattle grazing, and so on and so forth. And the, the idea is if you just let them breed out of control, their numbers just get very large and it becomes problematic for everybody. So as part of that sort of philosophy, whether it's right or wrong, I don't know, but part of that philosophy um, is sort of uh, wild horse roundups, um, sticking wild horses in, in um, corral. I went and saw a whole bunch of them in Rock Springs, Colorado in, in corrals. And quite honestly, it, it was a little bit ironic, right? Wild horses all penned up, just seems a little... Um, weird, um, but but nevertheless, that's part of the management of the herd populations. PZP, i.e., birth control, that's another uh, thing that they're, they're they're trying potentially to introduce. The other type, the other wild horses are on Indian reservation lands, where there really isn't any sort of controls in terms of what happens to those horses. Again, overpopulation can be a problem. It can be um, degrade the lands and so on and so forth for other farming. Um, situations that, that, that Native Americans need to, to, to for, for, for their own upkeep. So um, there, there, is, there are situations where some of those horses do actually go directly to slaughter um, by um, kill buys and, and so forth. Now I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on the issue of horse slaughter directly. Um, in the United States, uh, according to various um, resources, there's about 9 million horses um, at, at, at any given time, certainly um, at, at, this, at this time, um, 9.2 million horses. Uh, we slaughter 150,000 or there and thereabouts each year, so that's about 1.5% um, of the population. Um, I think it's kind of interesting to note uh, that it would be useful to know how many horses actually die of other causes, i.e. .e. humane euthanasia or just drop dead um, or, or whatever. And various reports puts that number at 150,000, again, same as the number of slaughtered, and 950,000. So clearly that sort of breadth of numbers clearly states we have no clue how many die of other causes, which is a shame because it's important to know that because if you end horse slaughter you need to really understand um, how, how the impact of absorbing that population into um, the, the, the overall numbers. Anyway, we don't know that, that's, that's just unfortunate. Okay, um, what I want to do is basically go through all the different arguments um, that are put forth um, either from pro-slaughter or from anti-slaughter folks to support their case. Um, the first argument um, is just the pure and simple emotional argument. The respect of the horse, 
the horse's role in human history. Um, in the United States, it's obviously been super critical, transportation, telecommunications, um, and agriculture, but it's also been critical all around the world, uh, building empires um, and for various other um, situations. World War I, millions of horses perished um, in support of whichever side they were on, right? I'm sure they were on the, the good side and the bad side, depending on what side you're on, so I won't go into that. But clearly the horse has been super important to us for a long period of time, and many suggest that that makes them a little bit different um, from other livestock and therefore should be protected. Um, the second argument is the humane treatment of the horse through the slaughter process. And this sort of falls into two areas, the slaughter itself and the transportation to slaughter. In terms of the slaughter itself, uh, many argue that the slaughter process is not designed for the horse. The horse has a longer neck than other livestock, is more of a flight animal than other livestock. Um, senses fear and so forth which makes the, the actual slaughter less precise. Um, the second aspect of the humane treatment is the, the transportation to slaughter. Um, this is the first time many of these horses are corralled together in trucks, um, held in feedlots and so forth. They were some kids pet um, two days before. This is a shocking experience and it's just very, you can just Google um, slaughter transportation or whatever, you see some horrific stuff. One, of the, one, one thing that's absolutely irrefutable is if you increase the humanity of the system, you increase the cost of the system. And clearly as a business, um, your goal is to reduce costs. Um, so that's the um, humanity of the system, which actually I think informed to some degree the EU's decision. Um, to potentially ban Mexico um, horse meat um, to some degree. The other aspect that has the EU um, all up in arms is the fact that the horse is not um, the, a food animal uh, when it's born. It's a non-food animal. Um, it's, as, as, I, as I've talked about, a working animal, a sports animal, a pleasure animal, or a wild animal. Um, and because of that, there's no real uh, proper traceability system in place, there's no tracking, there's no medical history, um, horses in horse racing getting all kinds of drugs, that's not documented through their lives, um, but it's not just horse racing, all kinds of horses are, are being doctored for one reason or another, then boom, all of a sudden they're a food animal um, when they hit the slaughter supply chain and all of a sudden we need documentation and so forth. Um, over the last couple of years the um, um, equine information document form EID form has been introduced to try to overcome some of these issues. Quite frankly, it's a poor um, proxy for the, the passport system that they do use within the EU to track um, animals and horses and, and drug histories and so forth. So the food animal um, argument is actually probably the strongest argument on the anti-slaughter side and, um, and, and so forth. Um, the next argument is, well, if we end horse slaughter, what happens to all the unwanted horses? Um, this is an argument that's proposed um, very strongly um, by the, uh, the, the pro-slaughter folks, and they basically frame this argument in such that uh, we don't want slaughter necessarily, but we kind of have to have it, which is unfortunate. Um, so they try to couch this as a more of a humane solution to the unwanted horse um, problem. Um, now, the reality is um, we don't know really if there is a correlation between unwanted horses and the amount of horses being slaughtered. What we do know are two um, irrefutable um, facts, I, I think. One is um, there are unwanted horses in certain situations. That's just the reality. If you've ever been to a kill auction and you say, well, that horse is not unwanted, well, I don't know if you've been to a kill auction because that's why they're there. Um, but the other side of it is um, the horses that are being purchased for kill, this is a demand-driven business, pure and simple. It, the number of horses that are being slaughtered has nothing to do with the number of potentially unwanted horses. It has all to do with how much horse meat the EU and other markets are demanding. So when you talk about the unwanted horse um, issue, I think it's very important to recognize um, that it's a demand-based business and yes, some horses in s present circumstances are unwanted. 
Um, another argument is the whole property rights argument um, that is put forth again by the pro-slaughter folks that basically say we should be able to do what we choose to do with the property in which we own and horse is our property. Um, and this sort of also plays into this idea that we don't want excessive government regulation and so forth telling us what to do, we should be able to do what we choose to do, etc. So another strong argument from the um, pro-slaughter folks. Um, Another issue is, is the horse a livestock animal or is it a companion animal? Many argue that it should be considered a companion animal, much like a cat and a dog, and treated differently. Um, others say, no, this is livestock. And as livestock is tr should be treated like other livestock, um, and, and as such, livestock goes to slaughter, so horses should go to slaughter. Um, and, and one of the, those realities is, if we do change the classification of the horse to companion versus livestock, that might have huge tax implications for those in the business of the horse. So that's problematic um, right there um, from, the, from the start. Um, other argument is just the pure sort of slippery slope argument. If um, the anti-slaughter folks are successful in ending horse slaughter, uh, the animal rights groups will be able to focus more of their energies on other um, livestock slaughter like cattle and pigs and so forth. So whilst we still have horse slaughter, that takes away some of their energy and their focus away from other livestock slaughter. So that's just simply the slippery slope argument. So those are all the arguments traditionally put forth by uh, both the pro-slaughter folks and the anti-slaughter folks. And I think it's just also important to recognize, you know, we're talking about horse slaughter for human consumption. That's important. And horse slaughter is very different from humane euthanasia. Um, I, we're not talking about ending a horse's life here. We're talking about how we end the horse's life. And humane euthanasia and horse slaughter are two separate things. Horse slaughter is done on a factory scale um, where lots of horses are gathered, shipped, feedlots and so forth. Humane euthanasia is done at your house, at your farm, um, in circumstances where the horse is familiar.